Oh boy. Whew. I love that song. I, I knew that was on I knew that was coming this week, so I've been singing it all week. Um, so I've been looking forward to it. You guys didn't know it was coming, but I did. So uh, be jealous. No, I just want to say if uh, I just want to say welcome. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, this thank you for coming. It's good to see everybody. It's good to see people in our overflow section. I never look over here. I realized that the other day. I never I never wave at you guys. Hi guys. I'm glad you guys are here too. Um, I just want to say, if this is your first time here, I just want to be the, may, hopefully not the first one, but I do want to say welcome. We're glad you're here. It's good to see you guys. Um, and I just have a few announcements before you as we, before we continue in our worship and giving, but uh, we don't have much going on. We have emergency action team. Uh, we have a meeting today after service. So if you are on that team, which you'll know if you are, we're just going to have a quick meeting right over here in overflow right after service. Um, next week, mark your calendars, uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Monday, we are having a uh, revival meeting uh, with Robbie Mitchell. I think I said his name. Yes. So, but you guys want to be here. You guys will want to be here. We, uh, it's going to be an awesome time of seeking the Lord. I've never heard him, but uh, the way that pastor talks about him, I know it's going to be awesome. So you guys want to be there. And I just want to encourage you guys, as I do every week, we have Bible studies throughout the week. If you are not a part of a Bible study, you either need to get into one of the current ones or you need to talk to somebody about starting one. Because I'm, as I was over here worshiping today, um, I was thinking about um, how important that is. And I was talking to somebody in the church, one of our leaders uh, in youth. I was, we were talking about something we're going to start doing in the youth of meeting together and having what's life groups. I'm blowing the secret, but we're going to start that. And here's why. Um, as I was talking to leaders, she said, I realized that every meaningful relationship I have, I got in a Bible study. I got in the coming together outside of this. It was those moments that where I have built meaningful relationships. So I'm telling you guys, coming on Sunday mornings is not enough. If you are depending on this to be fed and you're not thinking about it any other time of the week, you're missing out on so much more that God has for you. I was thinking about that as we were worshiping. We're supposed to do that every day. In Acts, when you read the book of Acts, the church was, it was not what they did, it was who they are. Church was supposed to be at the center of everything, and I feel really strongly about that this morning, that you should be, make it a point to be here every time the doors are open, not legalist, but because I'm telling you, Sunday morning is not enough. So tonight we're having a prayer meeting, and normally when we say prayer meeting, people go, that means we don't have church tonight. No, we have church tonight. You want to be here because I'm telling you, as we come together as a body to call out on the Lord, he will hear our prayers, and he will move in our midst. I believe that, and you should want to be in that. We should have a new thirst, a new hunger. That's why we're having a revival. That's a new hunger, a new thirst for him. That's what we're about. So I encourage you, get in a Bible study. Be here Sunday night. Be here on Wednesday. Make every effort you can to be a part of everything going on in the life of the church. Because you'll be blessed. You'll be encouraged. I promise. And that's all my announcements. I kind of went on a rant. But if the, uh, <laughs> but I'm passionate about it. I, I, I want the best for you because I know the Lord has so much more than just a Sunday morning service for you. He wants to be in part every aspect of your day. He wants to speak to you tomorrow morning. He wants to be with you as you go to work. He wants to do all those things, but we have to be intentional, aware, if the ushers want to come, so that I'll move on. <laughs> Everybody's like, oh boy, he's, he's excited this morning. <laughs> so, uh, and as, as we do every week, we're going to take up our Sunday morning tithe and offering. And last week, I talked about how this was worship. This is worship. So when you give, don't think about it as like, the Bible says, give generously and give with a joyful heart. If you're giving this today and you feel like I'm twisting your arm, don't give because I'm just encouraging you. Give with a joyful heart, expecting that the money that you will give, that you give today will be a blessing in the kingdom. Give, give today expecting that what you give, somebody will get saved because of that. Somebody will be encouraged. That's how we give today. Give expecting a kingdom return. All right? Father God, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we are thankful for what you did. Lord, you are our living hope. You are not dead, but Lord, you rose again and you are alive forevermore. So Lord, you are our living hope. And today as we give, we give because of how greatly you've given to us, Lord. 
I pray that this offering would be a blessing to the kingdom. And as we give, that we would give with a joyful heart and an expectant heart that you are going to use our money for more than we could ever use it for. And Lord, we ask it in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Man, thank you, musicians, so much for your worship this morning. I want to say a big thank you to everybody who helped Friday evening over in Massey Hall with, uh, with the benefit. Just a good time, good spirit, good crowd, and good food, too. You can never go wrong with chicken and dumplings. Amen. Amen. It was good. And a little over $3,900 just in that short evening. So thank you, guys. If you gave, thank you so much to helping a brother in need. Amen. That's what the body of Christ is about. Amen. Well, we have a special speaker this morning. And she, yeah, just give her a big hand. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Oh, she's already coming. I see she, she don't. I just got to tell you this. Normally when we have, you know, it's our protocol here it has been for 19 years when we have a special speaker, usually a missionary or, or like in Rob Evangelist comes, we always take him out for lunch. So I made the mistake yesterday. I said, well, if you're a special speaker, does that mean we have to take you out for lunch? <laughs> Guess what? We're going to the Mexican restaurant. Sir. <laughs> That's her favorite. My beloved wife this morning is going to speak to us. Amen. I'm not down up here, Dave. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Well, Today is National Women's Ministry Sunday, and each year the Assemblies of God designate a Sunday to children's ministry, youth ministry, missions. Um, the theme for this year for, for the National Women's Ministry is She Abides, and ladies will be seeing that through, throughout the year um, in some of our other meetings. We want to just take the time to say thank you to all of you women out there for all that you do, for your roles in ministry within the church, and for all that you do outside the walls of this church. Women are by nature multitaskers, and we wear lots of hats, and we manage lots of details. Whether you are male or female today, and regardless of your age, each of you has a sphere of influence that is uniquely yours. Whether it's with your family members, your friends, your co-workers, each of you are valuable in the work of the Lord. And whether you know it or not, all of us need to be fully equipped in the tools that God has for you. So I'm going to tell you, most of you probably know the programs that are here, but just to, uh, just to kind of go over that again, we have Sunday Night Sync, which is usually the third Sunday of the month. And that just gives us an opportunity to be in a smaller group setting, to study the word, to pray together, to build relationship. We have WOW Bible study, which I heard Pastor Ben just talking about Bible study. Um, that is on the second and the fourth Tuesday of every month. And we're just about to begin a new study. We have prayer on Tuesdays at 10. And typically we have outreaches, although last year was not a typical year. And I hear there are some ladies who want to meet together to form a Healthy Living God's Way class. So I think that's a great idea, but I just had some points here. If walking and cycling were really as good for you as they say, those postal workers would be immortal. Yeah. If whales swim all day, eat only fish, drink water, why do they still have a lot of fat? If rabbits run and hop but only live 15 years, and a tortoise doesn't run, does nothing, and lives for 450 years. What's wrong with that picture? So good. Uh, 
Okay, those are terrible jokes, and actually fitness is really important. Do any of you like to stay fit by hiking? All right, I, I see one hand out there, one hiker. So our first real home, uh, when we came back to Steelville the first time, was on the bluff above the Merrimack River. And it had a beautiful view. It looked up over the river like three times. It was the perfect, perfect place for hiking. And before we started having kids, I would come home from work and take off and, and hike almost every day. I hadn't been there in that property for years until this year. And I got permission from the owner and took my, my four-wheeler up there and parked and started walking. And it was wonderful to be back. Um, just getting able to, uh, to walk those paths, they were leaf strewn. The man, the father of the family who owns it now was an engineer, so he built kind of a mini fortress and he brought water up from the spring to the fortress and he put in these zip lines. Now I did not zip line while I was there, um, but I did climb out on the platform and just sat there and just enjoyed the presence of the Lord. Is there anybody else in this room who loves to be outdoors? to enjoy the presence of the Lord. Okay, lots of you need to hike while you're out there. Um, so as I was sitting on that platform and had no place to be, and I think you were doing a wedding that night, so I had no responsibilities. I just decided to stay. So I took lots of pictures. I watched the sunset, and it was so pleasant that I didn't want to leave. As it was getting dark and I was still sitting on the platform, I heard this unidentifiable sound. And it sounded like it came from the fortress. Well, I have a very active imagination. So um, I thought, I don't know what that was, but that didn't sound like a natural sound. So as the sun was gone, the chill started permeating the air, and I suddenly remembered that I'd heard that someone who was on the wrong side of the law had been living at a, at a car at the edge of the property. So I began to scoot my way off that platform and start back toward the four-wheeler. What had been so enjoyable before now had a completely different feel. And while I wasn't really afraid, my heart did beat a little faster. Then the landscape that had been so breathtaking and so enjoyable before seemed a little ominous as I was making my way back through the dusk. I had to watch out or, or try not to step on a snake, and I didn't want poison ivy because I was wearing my chacos. So I made it back to my vehicle, and I started home, and... When I got home, I started looking through those pictures, and the Spirit of the Lord really spoke to me because he told me nothing had changed on that bluff other than the sun went down and it got dark. But my perception, because of the circumstances, sure did. I allowed the darkness to change the way I felt. God's presence was every bit as much with me when I walked out of there in the dusk as he was when I was in the sunlight. And there's a parallel there for our spiritual lives. We have joys, we have sorrows, we have hardships and difficulties, they come. And sometimes they block out the light. We lose some joy and hope in our lives. But God's presence is with us in both of those situations. The God on the mountain is still God in the valley. The God of the sunshine is still God in the darkness. And this message today is entitled, Abide in His Presence, Scatter the Darkness. And Martha, would you... Ask the Lord to bless this message. You know what would have been really made a big difference for me as I was walking out of there? A light. <laughs> but I didn't have one, and my cell phone battery was about dead. Um, in this life, though, we have something to light our path, and it isn't dependent on batteries, and that is the Word of God. Uh, Psalms 119.105, and I'm going to go through a lot of scripture today. I would love for you to view it. I didn't do it all for the screen this time. Um, Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So when was the last time you needed a flashlight? I'm guessing your answer would have something to do with the dark or darkness. As humans living in a fallen world, we encounter darkness every day. You might experience Facebook-worthy sunny day picnics, 
But reality is that life can be more like a midnight walk through the woods. On any given day, you encounter more darkness than you do truth, both internally, which is what the enemy throws at you and what your flesh wrestles with, and externally, with all that is going on in this world that we live in. So if you're going to move forward to make your way without danger and to get where, you need to, where you're meant to be, you need something to light your way. Students, you need light when you go to school, when you hang out with your friends, when you're on social media. Those of you who are older need that too. You need light for your marriage and your parenting. You need light for your job and your relationships with your coworkers, your neighbors, your family. You need light for your struggles, your fears, desires, and weaknesses. You need light to help you deal with the unexpected. You need light to cope with new difficulties that emerge. You need light when you've been wronged. You need light to deal with the weaknesses of your body and the hardships of your heart. You need light for those moments when you're alone and overwhelmed. You need light for all the unknowns that will show up on your doorstep tomorrow, the day after, and for the rest of your life. Isn't it a bit disorienting when the electricity goes off and it's been off for a while? I don't know if anybody else does this, but I might be in one dark room, but when I go into the other room, I still try to flip the switch to turn the light on. Do you do that too? Um, it's out of habit, but it doesn't work when there's no source to power the light. Sadly, we often try to banish the darkness that falls around or within us on our own. The sorrow, grief, disappointment, disillusionment, lack of hope, but we aren't successful doing that on our own without God because he is the ultimate source that we need to plug into. Charles Spurgeon said, we are walkers through the city of the world and we are often called to go out into its darkness. Let us never venture there without the light giving word lest we slip with our feet. Each one should use the word of God personally, practically, and habitually that he may see his way and what lies in it. When darkness settles all around me, the word of God, like a flaming torch, reveals my way. He said that well. You don't need to stumble or fall in the darkness around you because the light of the world has graced you with the light of his word. And I'm going to say that again. The light of the world has graced you with the light of his word. It will shine around your feet in the midst of darkness. Our next scripture is 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. And it says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. If you keep up on studies, you may have seen that uh, we've become a biblically illiterate society in many ways. But there's no reason for that. We have classes here, and again, Pastor Ben was just talking about that. There are reading plans, there are devotionals, there's version. there's so many resources. If you're not already, get busy studying, get busy reading. Read his word and let the Holy Spirit interpret it for you. You'll gain wisdom, understanding, knowledge, strength, peace, joy. You'll be comforted, guided, inspired, equipped, kept from stumbling, and your life will be illumination in the darkness for others who are in their own darkness. So get out of the darkness and abide in his word. Point two, now that we're going to abide in his word, point two is have hope. That song we did today, we actually had looked at, I don't know, probably a year, year and a half ago. Um, it was a wonderful song and just really wanted to do it today because he is our living hope. Proverbs 13, 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Now, we just talked about eliminating the darkness with the light of his word. Now we want to talk about using those promises that we find in his word to place our hope in the Lord. All of us could agree that it has been a challenging, difficult year, and that's probably an understatement for many of you out there. I love life, and I know there are others of you out there who love life. Um, I choose to look for the joy in both the little and the big things, and I remember what James 4.14 says, and it says, what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. We get one life, we get one chance to live it. I want to make the most of the moments that I have. Um, still, life can get complicated. It can get hard. This past year, of course, with the shutdown, the interruptions to the normalcy of our lives, um, many of the things that bring joy, celebrations, weddings, uh, events, the uncertainty around us, 
the knowledge of evil practices, things that are going on, the oppression of those who are unable to defend themselves, political topsy-turvy, illness, death, the loss of dear friends and loved ones, trying to maintain life as usual when it hasn't been usual. Now, you take those factors, those were kind of extra new factors, and you combine, with, combine them with the normal life challenges, because we all have those, the difficulties and trials that we often experience here on Earth, you put it all together, and it's merged to bring anxiety, disillusionment, and a hopelessness for many. John 16, the Lord tells us, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So I like to do research. I did a little bit, looked at some George Barna studies, um, found out who is happy, sad, panicked, lonely, overwhelmed within the body of Christ. And I shared those with you, but they were a little depressing, pun intended. Um, in doing that research, though, I discovered other studies that indicated that people who regularly attend church are happier than those who don't. And that links up with a Gallup poll. So I'm going to give you just a little bit of statistics. It won't be too long. All right. You with me? Okay, this is a quote from the Gospel Project. It says, after a tough 2020, Americans said their mental health declined more than at any other point in the past two decades. One group, however, stood in contrast to the declines across the board, the weekly churchgoers. The declines in personal mental health ratings stretched across gender, race, marital status, age, income, and political affiliation. Weekly churchgoers are the only demographic group in which more say, get this, their mental health this year is better, or it was better in 2020 than it was in 2019. Just under half, which was 46%, say their mental health is, was excellent in 2020 compared to 42% in 2019. Why do you think that might be? Maybe because they clung more closely to the Lord. Those who say they attend less frequently did not experience the same well-being stability. The percentage or near weekly or monthly church growers, goers who rate their current mental health as excellent fell from 47% to 35, which was a 12 point drop. And then those who attended even less frequently had a similar drop from 42 to 29%. So we can credit, I believe, to the relationship that church goers have with the Lord. Now, Church is important for hearing the word of God, for worshiping him corporately, for meeting together with others of like precious faith. There's a reason for every instruction, every command <clears throat> that the Lord gives us in the Bible. There's a reason for everything. Hebrews 10, 24 says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, interestingly enough, we're talking about hope here. Uh, Hebrews 10, 23, which precedes the verses that I just read you, says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. So here we are on our second point this morning, which is have hope. And we see this correlation, and it's not a coincidence. The word hope is often thrown around loosely. We might say, I hope it doesn't rain today, or I hope we have tacos for dinner, or I hope the Cardinals win the World Series. So is that really hope or is that desire? Because here's the mistake that we often make. We use the word hope to convey a desire that we have for something to happen, but we don't, we're not really sure that it will happen. We just want it to happen. We're uncertain about it. But the Bible characterizes hope as certainty. One author defines it this way. Hope is waiting in confident expectation for God's promises in Christ. In other words, hope is being confident that the power of God is going to get you through whatever you're facing. We don't say, I hope Jesus Christ is coming back as if it might or might not happen. We know it's going to happen. We're confident that it's going to happen. That's real hope. We should have that confident confidence in the power of God. We should expect him to work, but that's where the problem lies for many. We're not confident in his power. When we lose hope, or we lose sight of hope, we begin to allow circumstances to change our focus. The resulting stress can affect many aspects of who we are, 
It can affect our bodies. It can affect our minds. Uh, this often leads to physical issues. And I probably don't have to tell you what they are, but low energy, headaches, stomach and abdominal issues, ulcers, aches, pains, tense muscles, chest pain, rapid heartbeat, high blood pressure, frequent colds and infections, and insomnia. Insomnia is a result of either internal or external factors. It can be caused by something inside our bodies. It can be, or that causes a disruption of the nat natural sleep process, or it can be a combination of external factors. Did you know that we have a heavenly father who has intentional insomnia? Listen to this, and if you want to turn to it, it's Psalms 121, 1 through 8. And it says, I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he watches over Israel. He who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going both now and forevermore. So he's not sleeping because he's watching out for us. And while he's watching out for us, maybe walking the floor, he is working out the details of our lives to accomplish the plans he has for us. And he's thwarting the plans that the enemy throws out there. Sometimes you don't feel him working. You can't see him working, but he is there and he's orchestrating and carrying out his plans for you and the ones you're praying for. This makes me think of how he used insomnia in an earthly king as part of an or a carefully orchestrated plan to save his people. Now, you've heard the story that I'm about to tell you. You've heard it many times. And if you went to church as a child, you heard it as a child, and you've heard it here. And I think I've spoken on it before, and I'm sure you have. But did you know that the Holy Spirit sometimes reveals things to you when you read a story in the Bible again or you study his word? He sometimes reveals something new to you. So I just encourage you to open up your heart and be ready for him to speak to you. So the king I'm referring to, and I did look up the pronunciation on this name, is Hazu Eris. And he was a bit of a brute in the book of Esther. It's the only book that God's name isn't mentioned in, but his fingerprints and the evidence of his orchestrating it is all over him. The king, who couldn't sleep, liked to display his power and his might through flaunting it in order to intimidate other provinces that were around him. So he threw this lavish, excessively long party, and the Bible says he was in high spirits. Now, at this point of the banquet, he was in extra high spirits because he consumed a little bit too much. So not thinking clearly, he called for his wife, who was hosting her own party. She was over there having a banquet for the ladies. And what he asked her to do would have been done by a prostitute or a concubine, so she refused. Now, remember, he was trying to impress all of his enemies, basically, the provinces around him with his power and his might. So her refusing did not set well. So he asked his advisors what to do, and they told him to get rid of her. And that's what they did. She was relieved of both her title and her crown. This many needed a new queen. Those same advisors came up with what seemed like a harebrained idea of scouring the kingdom for the most physically attractive women. Enter Esther. This, one, this young woman, under normal circumstances, would never have been considered for a queen. She was an orphan who was raised by a cousin Mordecai. Her guardian, Mordecai, was a Jew who had some favor within the kingdom, uh, skills or talents or something that set him apart, that, that he had favor with them. He advised her not to let them know that she was Jewish. And as the Lord planned, she caught the favor of one of the palace consultants, uh, the beauty consultants, who then begin to instruct her in beauty tips, and she was chosen as queen. Now, this probably would have been a hollow victory for her. I mean, it doesn't seem like this king was a very good guy, probably wasn't loving in nature or kindness or infirming or, or instilling value, but the Lord was going to take care of her. Shortly thereafter, um, in that plan, 
Shortly more thereafter, Mordecai happened to be at the gate. He was in the perfect place at the perfect time. Again, how the Lord arranges things. He overheard a plot by the bodyguards. To He heard them saying they were going to assassinate the king. So he asked Esther. He sent word to her to say, get this information into the hands of those who protect the king. And she did. Now, this is how scholars think that Haman, the, the evil guy in our story, they think that this is how he came to such an elevated position because he took the credit. The king then thought he owed his life to Haman. Now, Haman was a conceited, evil man. He was consumed with power for himself. He loved the superiority of his role and, and that everyone was forced to bow before him. Everyone was forced to bow him before him except for Mordecai, who believed and kept the command that he would bow to no one but his God. So this burned Haman, this conceited man, that bothered him. All those people out there were humbled at his feet and they were bowing before him except for that one Jew. He became obsessed, really. He became obsessed with getting rid of Mordecai and he hated him. He hated all the Jews and he decided to plan an event that would annihilate all of them once and for all. He took this claim or this plan to the king and telling him the Jews were a threat. They didn't obey the king's laws. They were becoming too populated, etc. And big kicker here, he would pay a large sum in silver for it to be done. The king agreed. He issued a decree to kill every Jew, from every baby to every elderly person, everybody in between. He signed the edict and he sealed it with his royal ring, saying, and these were his words, do with the people as you please. And again, I think that's a pretty good glimpse into just how brutal the king was, that he could wipe out an entire population without a second thought. When Mordecai heard this, he was absolutely distraught, and he went into mourning and prayer. He asked Esther to intervene by going to the king with the news to revoke the or, or with the news, and then to ask to revoke the or, order. She was terrified. Um, I've done a little bit of research, and I can understand why she was terrified. There were actually big burly guards with big axes. And that was part of their job. If someone came in without permission from the king, they were instructed to hack them down. Mordecai tried to convince her uh, to, to go to speak with the king, and she sent back word that everyone knew the king had one law for anyone who approached the king without being summoned, and that was death, unless the king chose to extend his scepter. She went on to say that he had to summon her for 30 days, but that's when Mordecai told her that she wasn't just anyone. He said, who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. In other words, you aren't just anyone. You are unlike anyone else. You are the bride of the king. You have rights that others don't have. You can go where others can't go, and you can ask for what others can't ask for. Do you see a parallel there? As followers of Christ, we're not just anyone. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this wonderful light. We are heirs and joint heirs who can come boldly into his presence and present our request to him. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If you need hope today, that is hope. That's a reason that we can put our hope in him. God's plan continues to unfold as Esther's people pray and fast for her for three days. Then she goes before the king. He holds out his scepter. She has his ear and his support because he says to her, what is your request? Even up to half the kingdom will be given you. But she doubts. Fear gets the best of her. The worry, the anxiety, the stress. She can't bring herself to tell him that she's a Jew and she can't ask him to stop the order. Instead, she invites him, and I would assume with all this on her mind, she's thinking of Haman. She invites him and Haman to come to a banquet. They come, and the, and the king asks her again, what is your request? It will be granted up to half the kingdom. Now, she didn't tell him this time either. Uh, whether it was 
fear or whether it was the Lord because the Lord was orchestrating everything and the next part of the story is an excellent part of the story. He was, God was still arranging the events for every detail to be in place so that what he wanted accomplished would be accomplished. It's a delay, but it's not a dead end. And that's a parallel for us, as, us too. You might be waiting for an answer to a prayer for yourself or someone you've been praying for. Maybe there's something that's stealing your, your, your joy, putting a damper on that, or, or maybe you've lost your hope, but it's coming. It might be a delay, but it's not a dead end. Haman leaves there after this first banquet, and he is gloating. His ego has just been fed, and his head has swelled, and he thinks he is, he's just so happy. He's the only one who got invited to the first banquet, not once, but twice. He's going to get to go again, just him. He couldn't be happier until, and this is just kind of funny, I think, he's headed out of the gate. He's just like on cloud nine. Everybody's bowing, and then there's Mordecai. Oh, that just, it just gets him. Um, when he gets home, he has, if you read the text, his friends, he summons his friends too. He's bragging to them. He's bragging to his wife and he's bragging to his friends about how rich he is, how many sons he has, how elevated his position is, how he's the only person invited to accompany the king to Esther's banquets. His life couldn't be better except for one problem. And then he starts whining about how in spite of all those things, nothing gives him satisfaction as long as he sees Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. And this is where I get goosebumpy because he starts planning the immediate demise of Mordecai. Just like our enemy, the enemy of our soul plans our demise. But just wait. His wife tells him to go build a gallows and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai hung on it. And she tells him, then you can go to dinner and be happy. The gallows were going to make a statement. This, these weren't just any gallows, but they were meant to strike fear in the heart of anybody who would oppose Haman. They were going to make them 75 feet high. So that was overkill for sure. That would have also taken a while. So he got a crew to start uh, work right then and to work through the night. So if they're working and you're building something and you have to put something together, it's going to be a little bit noisy, isn't it? Yeah. The prime minister's palace more than likely, would have been close to the king's palace. So there we've got this hammering all night long. It's the ominous sound of impending death, and it could be heard throughout the night. Could that be something God used also as part of his plan for the next part of the story? Because the king over there, he wasn't sleeping. He was tossing. He was turning. Um, finally, he called for the history book, and I don't know if it would have been a book or a big scroll, but um, it was the chronicles of his reign, and they were pretty thorough there, so I'm sure it would have been huge. Um, the attendant opened it to where God wanted it open, so this big, massive amount of writing, the Lord had it fall to right where it needed to be. And had the attendant looked at, look at that, that part. And he began to read what had really happened with that assassination plot. And that Mordecai is the one who had uncovered it. The king had never known that it was Mordecai. And then that gave him something new to think about. He says, what was done for Mordecai? And this attendant says, nothing. Okay. There's another example of how God is always working, even when you can't see it. When you don't feel it. You're getting an answer even when you don't know it because our God has intentional insomnia and he is plotting your victory and thwarting the enemy's plans. Isaiah 54, 17 says, No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Isaiah 54, 17. Morning finally comes. Haman, he's already up, he's dressed, he's happy, he's waiting in the court for the king who's not so happy because he didn't sleep well. He's had time to reflect and to honor Mordecai for saving his life, and so when Haman comes in with his plan, the king says to him first, what should be done to honor a man whom the king delights in? Well, Haman, 
with his inflated ego over here. You can almost picture it, can't you? He's probably thinking, ah, oh, who else would he want to honor but me? So he comes up with this really gaudy, actually, but this over-the-top plan to honor who he thinks is himself. There's, he tells him that there's going to be a processional with a royal robe that the king has worn and a hoist horse with a royal crest that the king has ridden. He tells, the, he tells him to pick a noble man to put the robe on the honored one and lead him through the streets, shouting, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Well, the king looks at him and he says, basically, probably something like, perfect, what a great idea. You go at once to and go get Mordecai and do that for him and don't leave anything out. Can you imagine? <laughs> uh -huh. That was a twist, wasn't it? But you see, that's how God works. He turns, and I, I, he, I think he has a sense of humor too. He turns what was meant for evil in our lives out for good. Mordecai was supposed to be hanging from the gallows then, but instead he's being paraded with the robe and the horse of the king. Just like God redeems us from what we deserve, and he puts his royalty on us as heirs and joint heirs. Well, you know the ending. They have that second dinner where Esther reveals that she's Jewish and tells him what's going on, that her people are about to be destroyed at Haman's hand. The king, who already didn't have a good night's sleep and already probably was pretty grumpy, um, he's trying to figure out what to do. I mean, this is his right-hand man. He's trying to make his decision when Haman then falls on the bed of Esther, the king sees it. Um, and that pretty much seals it for him. He orders Haman to be taken out and hung on the very gallows that were built for Mordecai. And again, our God has intentional insomnia. He turns what was meant for evil into good for us. In Genesis 50, 20, it says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And those words were spoken by Joseph, but they apply throughout the chronicles of the examples of the people in the Bible, God's faithfulness in their lives and his faithfulness in ours. Do you need hope in your life today to replace worry or anxiety or disillusionment or fear? Bring those things to him. Life can be hard. All of us in this room. Worrying, and I, I found this quote from someone else. This was not my own, but it says, worrying doesn't make you weak. It makes you human. But you don't have to dwell in a state of worry, and you should not, because God tells us not to worry, to give it to him through prayer. And Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He has intentional insomnia so that we can sleep. Instead of being a warrior, a, instead of being a worrier, be a warrior. Banish the darkness through the promises of his word and live in the light of his hope, which brings us to our next point. You can trust an unknown future to a known God. You got to trust him. And, and Psalm, and this is a shorter point, but it says Psalm in Psalm 9, 10, and those who know your name put their trust in you for you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. This is, I know I just told you a story. This next one's really short, and it's only 11.22, so we're okay. I'm just going to just talk a little bit about David's, how faithful God was to David. And in this trust him, we're going to talk about how you encourage yourself in the Lord. So David, as you know, the Lord had been so faithful to him. And there's the stories of him, him killing the lion and the bear and then Goliath. Imagine that. This little boy and big Goliath. But now as an adult, David is at one of the lowest places in his life. Saul had been relentlessly pursuing him in a murderous jealousy. Uh, David had aligned himself with the Philistine king and trying to stay out of Saul's clutches. But it wasn't a good thing because the Philistines didn't serve God. And... Um, Basically, David had 600 men. He'd been given Ziklag by this king who, in trade, he was a mercenary for the king. He really wasn't where he was supposed to be. Does that make sense? Have any of us ever been where we're not supposed to be? Yes. Well, he actually aligned himself with them, and he was going to go into battle with them against Israel because of what's going on with Saul. But the Lord stopped it, and he stopped it by doing this. 
one of the other Philistine rulers got angry and basically said to him, um, or said to the other rulers, if, if he goes into battle with us, what's to keep him from turning and turning on us? So they sent him back. Now, when I said it's at a really low point, not only has he been running from Saul, not only has he um, not able to be home, but he gets back to the home where he and his 600 men were living in Ziklag. And this is from 1 Samuel 30, 1 through 6. It says, three days later, when David and his men arrived home at their town of Ziklag, they found that the Amalekites had made a raid into the Negev and Ziklag, and they had crushed his town and burned it to the ground. They'd carried off the women and the children and everyone else, but without killing anyone. When David and his men saw the ruins and realized what had happened to their families, they wept until they could weep no more. Now, fortunately, I don't think anybody in this room has had an army come and burn your home and take your family. So we don't know how that felt. But I dare say, as I look across this room today, if you've lived long enough, some of you have wept until you could weep no more. You've borne grief, disappointment, heartache, disillusionment, abuse, the loss of your dreams, betrayal, fear, or pain. And sometimes it seems that it just keeps coming. It did for David. His family was among those captured. He was at the lowest point in his life, but it got worse because those men, those 600 men, they turned on him. They started to hurl accusations at him, like, and maybe they were true that he left Ziklag unprotected. And when they turned on him, they wanted to kill him. They wanted to stone him. So here he is, not only is he heartbroken, but now they want to stone him. These were his loyal men, his loyal men who, who uh, they no longer were, they're angry. It was a tremendous hit for him. He'd lost their support, he'd lost their respect. It seems he's lost everything. The next part of that verse that I just read to you is that David encouraged himself in the Lord. And I'm going to say it again. David encouraged himself in the Lord. There wasn't anybody else. His family was gone. His men had turned on him. He was alone except for God. Now, he was also not in the place where he should have been. But if you've ever read the Psalms, and I know that you have, then you, it doesn't even take much to imagine <clears throat> how he would have began to encourage himself. He began to praise God. Can you picture him taking his harp? Can you picture him going and sitting in the ruins of where his house had been and beginning to sing praises to the Lord? Did he feel like praising? Probably not. But he began to sing, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. Psalms 33, and there's so many psalms you could use here to illustrate this point, but Psalms 33 says, No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. In other words, we can't do it in ourselves. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. And he says in 4211, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. He prayed. He encouraged himself in the Lord. And I know that there are people in this room today who need to be encouraged in the Lord. The rest of David's story, it turns out well. The Lord was with him. The Lord had his fingerprints upon him. He was planning all of this, even though David had been in the wrong place at the wrong time and made a decision to align himself with the Philistines at the same time. The Lord is merciful, and he is good, and he is forgiving, and he is still working things out. Even when you're not where you're supposed to be with him, he's still orchestrating, and he's still planning, and he's still rearranging your path to get you back where you need to be. Here's the rest of the story. It says, and when they, oh, David did, after he praised and prayed, 
It says he had the ephod brought to him and he began to pray and he felt that he should go on to pursue the Amalekites. Now, his men were exhausted. They'd just ridden in for three days. I don't know what they'd been doing before that, but it was a, a journey for them to go. They were not in the best of shape to go fight a battle, but he felt the Lord impress him to go, so they did. And it says, and when, and, uh, when they had brought him down, there they were. This is talking about the other soldiers. They're spread all over the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of the great spoil which, had t which they had taken from the land of, of the Philistines and Judah. Then David attacked them from twilight until evening of the next day and recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And nothing of theirs was lacking, either small or great. No sons or daughters were lacking, no spoil or anything which they had taken for them. David recovered all. And the Lord wants to let you recover all, all your joy. Encourage yourself in the Lord. The God who had given David victory over the lion and over the bear and over Goliath, he gave him victory in this situation. David lifted his praise in place of his circumstances, from the ashes of that city, in spite of all that was going around him, he lifted his praise in, instead of his circumstances. Our God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. No matter your circumstances, God is above it. He is sovereign and he is seated on his throne today and he has intentional insomnia He's called you to scatter the darkness from your life that would distract or disrail you. You don't need to live without hope. You don't need to live in fear, fear or worry. Claim his promises as we talked about in that first point. Read his word. Claim his promises. Apply them to your life. He's working out the circumstances of your life for good. And I asked them to come play a song because David was a psalmist and a lyricist and a singer and he encouraged himself in the Lord he began by singing and praising so as we close today I, I pray that this, this message really speaks to your heart in a time when we need hope would you just encourage yourself in the Lord You are here, ruling in our midst. I worship you.
what he is to us, friends. My God, that is who you are. Can you give the Lord a praise this time? Father, that's just a few of who you are, names, waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. It's what you are to us. I'm so grateful today, Father, that you use your word and use the Holy Spirit as a combination to lead and guide each and every person who will hear you and who will adhere to your word and obey your word. Father, for each person who's in this building right now who hears our voice, or maybe they're watching later on Facebook or YouTube, I pray, God, that you would make yourself more real to us than we've ever been since we were born again. And I pray for those who aren't truly born again to come to you right now and surrender their life and repent. Turn from the old life and turn to you because you are the one and only living hope. There is no other hope. We pray for people. We pray for leadership. We pray for presidents and Congress and judges. That's how we're one in this nation. Father, they are not our hope. We can put confidence in men, but you're our hope. And we turn to you for that hope, that sure word, Father, that sure word of prophecy is what the word says. May we wholeheartedly follow after you. May we find our passion in knowing and loving and serving Jesus Christ. And we do it by loving, starting right now, by loving one another. I'm going to ask you right now, in your own way, would you just look at your neighbor and say, I love you. I love you this morning. And because I love Jesus, I love you. And Lord, help us to go in that love. And help us, Father, to do what you've called us to do in this earth. Every moment of every day. May we take your spirit, may we take the presence of God and your word and move out each and every day and be ready to give a reason for the hope that lies within us. Speak to us to go, speak to this one and this one, to live, to bless others, to give, just like Jesus did. We love you today, Father. Thank you for each family member, one here today. Bless their homes. Make your face to shine upon them. May we have eyes to see people as Jesus did. May we do your will, Father. It's in the wonderful, holy, precious name of Jesus we ask and pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen.